Hello and welcome to this session on the role of the nighttime economy in identifying and protecting children from child exploitation. We're hoping to be together for 15 minutes. What we're going to cover over the next 15 minutes is looking at what child exploitation is and what we mean by that definition, the role of the nighttime economy in spotting and reporting child exploitation, and then how we respond if we have concerns that a child might be exploited. So I'm delivering this session on behalf of Bernardo's Nightwatch. Nightwatch is a service that works across London to educate people that work in or with the nighttime economy so they can recognise children who are being exploited. Before we get started thinking about the content, my first question to pose to you is why is it that talking about children being abused feels so emotional? It could be for lots of different reasons, but these are some of the things that I was thinking about. It could be that it's emotional because of your own personal experiences. It might be emotional because you're a parent or carer yourself for children, or it might be that you're very empathetic and hearing about these experiences makes you feel emotional. I would say that we need to practice self-care. So if after the session, it does feel quite heavy, make sure you reach out to colleagues and talk about what we've been learning about today. So what is the nighttime economy and why is it that we think the nighttime economy is so important for safeguarding young people? These are some examples of the nighttime economy. It could be that you work in one of these job roles. You might work in another job role that works outside of the normal nine to five hours. Or it might be that you support people that work in these roles too. What we found when looking at public scandals and times where things have gone wrong for safeguarding children is that sometimes people in job roles that work across the evening and nighttime see children being exploited, but they might not know what to do about it. And research suggests that if people know what they should do and what to look out for with child exploitation, then they can respond better to protect children. So what do we mean when we say child exploitation? What does that term mean? We're going to focus today on two specific types of child exploitation, sexual exploitation and criminal exploitation. Historically, you might have heard terms like child prostitute. We've moved away from terminology like that and we make sure the words we use don't blame children and we look at it through the lenses of the child not having a choice and being exploited by people who have more power over them. Firstly, we're going to take a look at child sexual exploitation and what we mean by that. So just to say, with child sexual exploitation, it is a type of child sexual abuse. It's a specific way that children can be sexually abused. I've broken it down into three elements so we can understand the definition a bit more. So the first thing we need to take place for it to be child sexual exploitation is for there to be an individual or a group that takes advantage of a power imbalance. This power imbalance could be lots of different things. It could be age, social status, gender, financial status. It might even be something like immigration status. They then will coerce, manipulate or deceive a child who's under the age of 18 into sexual activity. And just a reminder that in England, anyone under the age of 18 is legally a child. And then this last element we need, the third part we need, is there has to be an exchange for something tangible or intangible or a gain for the adult. Now, what do we mean by tangible or intangible? Tangible might be things like, for example, drugs. It might be gifts like shoes or money. But intangible might be harder for us to see. So it could be, for example, a place to stay, love or protection that that child really needs. So that exchange can be tangible or intangible or for that adult's gain. Now, this might make people feel a little bit confused. The age of consent to have sex in England is 16, but the age of a child is under 18. Does that mean that a 16 or 17 year old could experience CSE, child sexual exploitation, given that actually they can consent to have sex? The answer is yes, they can definitely still be abused and they still need to be protected because they are children, even though they can consent. If we have concerns about power imbalances or any of those exploitation or abuse concerns, 
we still need to make sure they're protected. And actually research shows that 16 and 17 year olds are particularly vulnerable to being sexually exploited. Now we're going to move on and take a look at child criminal exploitation. Luckily, the definition is very similar, but we're going to switch out that sexual element with the criminal element. So similar to last time, we have these three different parts. The first part being that power imbalance. And remember that could be lots of different things that create a power imbalance. That coercion manipulation into a criminal activity. Now with criminal exploitation, this can often involve a lot more violence um, and control. And then we have that third element, which is that exchange. And again, all of those things we talked about, it could be drugs, it could be money, it could be gifts, or it could be those things that we can't see, love, protection, support, someone that's there for you. With child criminal exploitation, the words you might think about automatically is things like uh, being a drug dealer, gangs, county lines. But there's other ways that children can be criminally exploited too. So it might be, for example, things like begging, pickpocketing or breaking into someone's house. Now, at this point, sometimes people stop and they think, does this mean that children cannot commit crimes anymore? Are children all immune from committing crimes? That's absolutely not the case. And children can commit crimes. And remember, the age of criminal responsibility is 10 in England. But what this is, is different. It's when a child is being coerced, manipulated and deceived into committing crimes. They're being exploited by the adults around them. So it's a different situation to a child making a choice, a free choice to commit a crime. One of the things that can be really confusing when we think about child criminal exploitation, child sexual exploitation, is that it might be young people don't perceive themselves to be victims. If you come across some of these young people, they might be very angry, they might be very defensive. They might say, this is my choice, this is what I want to do. But if they're saying that, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't have the same child protection response. This is actually very common for young people to not identify themselves as being victims in exploitative situations. So, a question. Professionals in the nighttime economy are not responsible for safeguarding children and young people. Do people think it's true or false? So it's false. There's definitely responsibilities that professionals have that work across the evening and nighttime, and they can happen in lots of different ways. So it might be you have social and moral responsibilities. For example, in your contracts, it very likely stipulates that you have some type of responsibility to report and respond to children being abused or exploited. It could also be a reputational responsibility. So for example, it might damage the reputation of a local business or the local authority if we don't appropriately respond to children being exploited. But lastly, legislation also means that we have responsibilities to keep children safe and respond. And that can be in lots of different forms. So here are some examples of the different le legislation the nighttime economy has and must abide by when we think about children being exploited. So for example, licensed venues, if we think about bars, pubs, places saying, selling alcohol or drinks after certain times, the licensing act, one of the key pillars is to consider protecting children from harm. In terms of hotels, they have to consider child sexual exploitation. And if there's criminal investigations, they must work with the police to provide information about guests that stay in their hotels. Taxi drivers since 2020 have had responsibilities for making sure they are trained, particularly with a focus on child criminal exploitation. And we see similar legislation when we look at the Gambling Act of 2005 as well. And I think as time goes on, we're going to see an increase in people outside of police and children's services having some level of responsibility for thinking about spotting children being abused and exploited. When we think about risk indicators, there's so many things that we might pick up on in our jobs. These are some examples that are good to look out for. So if you have children that are in an unknown location, they seem to not know their surroundings. If you have a child that's being very secretive about information, hiding a lot of information, gifts, items outside of financial means, we looked at in our definitions earlier. Criminal activity, if we think about minor offending, when we look at some public scandals, we've seen that children who are being sexually exploited sometimes assaulted their perpetrators and then were criminalised for doing so. If we have adults who are in control of young people who don't allow young people to speak for themselves, that's something we need to be questioning. 
And also, if we have children who are staying there in a relationship with an adult and there's a real significant age gap that's going to create that power imbalance. I'm more thinking about those 16 plus young people here, too. But what might this look like to you in your daily work? So it could be, for example, if you're a market inspector, that you have people who work in the market coming up to you and saying, actually, Tuesday mornings, we're noticing a pattern of some people coming in cars, dropping off young people. It's happening every Tuesday. It could be, for example, maintenance staff being aware of drug dealing in a certain area and noticing actually there's young people now that are involved in this drug dealing. Is this potential criminal exploitation? It might be noise complaints from a specific home and then that's investigated, that home's thought to be potentially a brothel. It might be that there's young people coming and going that are actually being sexually exploited and making sure we're not gendering any of these things. It could be girls, it could be boys that are being exploited in all of these different ways. So what do we need to do if we come across a young person and we're concerned they might be exploited through criminal or sexual exploitation? The first thing we need to do is think about it. Remain vigilant all the time. Often after training, people say to me, they look back and they realise they had seen some concerns before, but they weren't aware of what they should be doing or what the issue was before. So remain vigilant and keep an eye out for children that might be vulnerable. If you are a little bit concerned, you want to start a conversation, you can ask young people for basic information, potentially letting them know your job role. It might be that you're able to say, you know, I can keep an eye or I can make sure you're safe or I could report it here if you want me to. And then recording. We need to make sure we're recording things. So let's go back to that example of the market inspector. If you're a market inspector and you have um, people that work in the market coming up and saying, we're noticing this. It's about getting people to record what they're seeing. It could be patterns over a period of time, or it might be one very clear incident where there's concerns a child has been exploited. But encouraging recording of what, where, when, and who, thinking about things that might be useful. So for example, an appearance, a license plate, ID cards, locations, is there CCTV? Is there patterns that we're seeing? Making sure that's written down. And then responding. Now, it could be that a child directly discloses to you in your job role that they're being exploited. And if that is the case, you need to always reassure a child they've done the right thing. But a lot of the time, it might be that you don't get a very clear disclosure that a child is being exploited. It might not be clear what's happening, but you have worries. In that situation, it can be really useful to empower a child with information if you do get talking to them, telling them things like, did you know you can call Childline or you can call 999 if um, you're ever in danger? Those little bits of information might make a really big difference to a young person. But also very important to remember, you should only be intervening if it's safe to do so and it's not going to heighten the risk to the young person and to you. It might be that you're in a situation where it's better to leave the situation and call the police when you're, you have some distance than actually going in and intervening and heightening the risk that is presented at that very moment. But that's going to be a judgment that you would have to make in that moment. I would also make sure when responding that you look at your internal procedures as there'll be very clear internal procedures for reporting safeguarding concerns too. So when we think about reporting, where do we go and who's appropriate to talk to? If you are concerned that a child is at risk of serious harm, if there's an ongoing crime, if there's a potential perpetrator at a location, you should definitely be calling police on 999. And police are always going to take child safeguarding issues seriously. So don't feel hesitant to contact the police if you think it's an appropriate course of action on 999. If it's a non-emergency, so for example, if you have one of those situations where there's a pattern of information arising, but you're not quite sure, then it might be more appropriate to call police on 101. If it's someone that's working in, for example, a hotel, a taxi driver, working in a licensed venue, they can call 101 and quote Operation Make Safe, and that's a specific police operation around safeguarding children in the nighttime economy. But you're free to call police on 101 and make that report. If it is that you don't feel able to call police um, and you want to remain anonymous, then you can call Crime Stoppers as well and make a report through that route. Whenever you're making a report about child safeguarding, always make sure you keep a record of crime reference numbers along with your record of the concerns. So that brings us to the end of our 15 minutes. If you have any questions, any thoughts or any comments, feel free to email nightwatchlondon at bernardos.org.uk. But I hope you found that useful and had some learnings from today's session.